Exodus chapter 25 is where we pick things up in our journey through the scriptures and we pick things up in verse 23 Um, never good to stop in the middle of a chapter but that's where we stopped and uh, story of my life but we ended with Moses up on Mount Sinai and he is receiving revelation from the Lord uh, concerning a tabernacle that is to be built uh, it is to be a habitation for God in the midst of his people in the midst of the children of Israel and he is before describing the tabernacle itself and its construction he is uh, giving details to Moses about how to construct certain furnishings within uh, the tabernacle that would, would again, constitute furnishings with, within the tabernacle. Very important to realize, as we saw last week, all of these things speak of Jesus. They're all pictures and types uh, of him. A lot of instruction in it also as we uh, move on and look at the priests and different things. A lot of instruction for us also because the Bible declares that we have been called uh, as Christians, each and every one of us, to be a priest uh, unto the Lord in the world. And the priest had a twofold function. He had a responsibility to represent God before the people as we represent the Lord before the, all of the people that watch us every single day in this world. And then a, a, a responsibility to represent the people before God in intercession and prayer for them. And that's also our responsibility. So that gives us a little bit of, of background. And now we resume his description of the furnishings that are to be built. He's already described the Ark of the Covenant and the Mercy Seat. Verse 23. You shall also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And so we have a table that is to be built now, 36 inches long, a cubit, about 18 inches. It's to be 18 inches wide, 27 inches high. Not terribly big, but uh, adequate for its purpose. And you shall overlay it with pure gold, so the wood is to be covered with the gold. Again, as we saw last week, the wood speaks of the humanity of Jesus, the gold of the deity uh, of Jesus, both of those things coming uh, wonderfully together in him. So you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold all around it. You shall make for it a frame of a hand breadth all around, and you shall make a gold molding for the frame all around. And so you've got this tabletop, and if you've ever tried to move a coffee table or something, and is it, oh, there's no need to move all of those glass things up on top of it, just to move it right over here this short distance, and then somebody slips or tilts or something, and they all go crashing off. Well, you need a lip on a table. And especially when that table is going to be transported, needs to be portable, as it needed to be for the children of Israel. They were a pilgrim people. This tabernacle needed to move, uh, the, the furnishings needed to move with them with the tabernacle. So a lip was to be put on the edge of the table. The, the table was the table of showbread, as we'll get to in just a moment. But on that table, each week they would place uh, 12 loaves of bread. Uh, we think of loaves as these gigantic things. In those days, they would have been more like buns or something in between a loaf like we have today and a bun. And they represented the 12 tribes of, of Israel. And, uh, and so if they were going to move uh, the the ark of the the uh, move the tabernacle and move the furnishings. There needed to be this lip so the bread wouldn't slip off of the top of the table and spill to the ground. God's I, God is into detail. I really like that. Um, I got a lot of details in my life that need his attention, and he's got he's got an eye for it. 
praise the Lord. So you shall make for it again a handbreadth all around, verse 25, and you shall make a gold molding for the frame all around. And you shall make for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are on its four legs. The rings shall be close to the frame as holders for the poles to bear the table. So just as with the Ark of the Covenant, there was this uh, arrangement of rings built into the furniture, poles put through them, uh, again, in order to transport these pieces of, of furniture. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold, and the ta- that the table may be carried with them. You shall make its dishes its pans, its pitchers, and its bowls for pouring, you shall make them of pure gold. And so there were uh, other utensils that were a part of all of this. They were to be made of pure gold. And you shall set the showbread on the table uh, before me always. Now, uh, the, what this represents in terms of the Lord and our relationship with the Lord Again, the twelve loaves, there were, there were twelve loaves, as we'll see later, that were placed upon this uh, table of showbread. Uh, one representing each of the, the tribes of, of Israel. And they were there as a reminder, we see in verse 30, constantly a reminder of the presence of God before me always. Now, in the Middle East, uh, a table uh, or a meal is a sign of fellowship. And, and so as the Ark of the Covenant spoke of the presence of God um, and, and the holiness of God, this particular furnishing speaks to us of fellowship with God. One of the interesting things about the showbread, uh, as we get to it a little bit later in, in the book, is that every week they would change out the showbread. Uh, so they would bake new bread, put it on, on this particular table of showbread, and then at the end of the week, before they brought out the new showbread, uh, the priests would eat that bread. And they would eat it in the holy place. Not the holy of holies, but in the holy place. And they would always eat it with the high priest. With the high priest. And the picture is, right, we're all priests as, as members of the body of Christ. And so it speaks of the fellowship that we have with Jesus, how he feeds us, how he sustains us as our high priests and our ministry as priests in, in the world. And, and so it speaks of how he sustains us physically and, and spiritually. Beautiful picture of, of the, the table of showbread. Then he moves on to the third furnishing that he describes, and it's a lampstand, a menorah. And you shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work, its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one piece. Uh, so no welding this together. And six branches shall come out from its side, three branches of the lampstand out of one side, three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower. Three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental knob and a flower. And so for the six branches that come out of the lampstand. On the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower. There shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand. Their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece, All of it shall be uh, one hammered piece of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it. In other words, for uh, the, the light to be lit on it. And they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it. And its wick trimmers and their trays, so the wicks and and then the trays that would be used to put the wicks in it and all of that, uh, these accompanying instruments shall be made of pure gold also. 
and it shall be made of a talent, about 75 to 100 pounds of pure gold with all these utensils. I don't know what gold is going for an ounce. Uh, some of you probably know. But uh, you figure out what 75 pounds to 100 pounds of gold would go for a lot invested there uh, in, in that uh, a particular lampstand and see that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain and as God is going to do over and over again here through this section he's going to exhort Moses to make these things exactly as he has told them uh, him to make them uh, they can't be improved upon uh, God deliver us from clever men and women who think they can improve upon the things of God all God is looking for is faithful men and women who will just do what he has called us to do and then he'll take care and, and add everything that needs to be added uh, to that. The lampstand or the menorah, was it up there earlier? Was it? How did it look? There we go. You know, I've been to Israel a few times. And I keep looking for one that meets this description, but I think it's too expensive to make. Well, not of pure gold, for sure. Uh, I'm a pastor. But the, to get one even of the bronze or whatever, and, uh, but th that's, that's what it is, a lampstand. Interesting thing about the lampstand, it was the only source of light in the holy place was the lampstand. The only source of light in, in that place. And the, the, light, the light of the lampstand in the holy place wasn't there in order that God could see what he was doing inside of the holy place. He doesn't need light like that. But it was light provided for the priests. Now, we know the Bible teaches that Jesus is the light of the world. He said uh, it, 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 uh, to uh, a group that were, was with, around him one day, he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus is the light of the world. And uh, to disregard his teaching and his instruction, it's to, to live in moral, spiritual, physical, uh, in, in some respects, of, of, of darkness. And, and, uh, but this... Uh, lampstand it speaks of Jesus as the light the revelation that he brings into our life as priests so we can go about our, our business in, in serving him his wisdom his instruction his example WWJT what would Jesus do you can never lose by figuring that out in a situation in doing it he is the light to us in, in our ministry as, uh, as, as priests Interesting thing is that the lampstand is made of gold and the most precious metal. And, and it speaks of how precious and how valuable Jesus' example is to us. The light that he gives to us is to us in, 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 all, in, in our lives. And so that's what it, it represents to us. We're not in this alone. Jesus gives us light in order for us to do our work for him. Then having dealt with some of these furnishings, of the tabernacle, he in chapter 26 begins to speak about the construction of the tabernacle uh, itself. And he says, Moreover, you shall make uh, the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen, the blue. Uh, and blue, purple, and scarlet thread with artistic designs of cherubim, you shall weave them. Now he's going to describe a, uh, in this chapter a framework that is going to be kind of like how you would frame a house to support the outside covering uh, of the house. So he's going, to, he's going to describe the framework that, that holds up the tent, so to speak, for, supports the tent. And then there's going to be a series of four layers that are going to be placed one on top of another uh, over the framing. Layer number one, then on top of that, layer number two, layer number three, layer number four. And all of them speak uh, of Jesus. And so that's what he begins with now in verse one. The very first layer that would be at the bottom so that when you would walk in and you'd see all this uh, framing uh, around in order to support these layers, uh, framing across the top framing along the sides 
And uh, the framing wouldn't be built right upon one another, so all you're seeing is gold-covered wood. It would be set, uh, you know, like this, as you would uh, do in a house, two-foot space in between, uh, you know, the, the framing structure, so that this first layer of linen, when you would walk into the holy place or into the holy of holies, it covered all of that. This is the linen that you would see. And, and so, very, very uh, beautiful. You'd walk in, and uh, here is this curtains, fine woven linen, purple, blue, scarlet thread, artistic designs of cherubim or angels woven into them. So when you would walk into the holy place or the holy of holies, if you were the high priest and you'd look around, you would just see these unbelievable, beautiful colors. They're on the wilderness. It's all uh, uh, gold, you know, I mean, the color of sand and all of that. So you would come into this and you'd see all of these beautiful colors and you'd see these angels woven into the fabric all over the place. And what it spoke of was heaven because the tabernacle is a model of heaven. So it's, it speaks of all of the angelic activity around the throne of God in heaven. Heaven is going to be a very, very beautiful place. You ever see a place that's just stunningly beautiful uh, on earth, whether it's something God created, even in its fallen condition, you go, wow. Or you go someplace and you see what man has done. And you go, that is stunning in its beauty. Heaven is going to be Unbelievable in its beauty. Uh, sometimes I think about when I'll be officiating at a, uh, a coronation service or a funeral service, and uh, uh, one of our brothers and sisters has gone on to the Lord uh, before us. Uh, so often I will think about Revelation chapter 4 and 5, and sometimes I'll encourage people, read, read those two chapters for that little glimpse of heaven that we get there, the colors, the sounds, the activity. Your loved one is there right now. We are headed there one day. Heaven's a beautiful place, and this was a reminder uh, of all of that. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits and the width of each cu uh, curtain 4 cubits. And so uh, they're going to make uh, 10 of these uh, curtains, but each one of them was 42 feet long, 6 feet wide. And uh, every one of them shall be, uh, every one of the curtains shall have the same measurements. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. You shall make loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtain, on the selvage of one side, and likewise you shall do on the outer edge of the other curtain of the second set. Fifty loops you shall make in one curtain, fifty loops you shall make on the edge of the other curtain. Make sure they line up that is on the end of the second set that the loops may be clasped to one another and you shall make 50 clasps of gold uh, speaks of the presence of God and couple the curtains together with a clasp so that it may be one tabernacle so the the uh, this particular large piece of cloth ultimately uh, when it was all joined together 60 feet by 42 feet but again it needs to be portable you have to be able to move it so it was in 10 different sections joined together taken apart when it was time to move and and so that was uh, that was this beautiful woven cloth that was, was to be put together and uh, speaks of Jesus, our taste of heaven, our contact with heaven. Then on top of this particular layer of, of fabric or, or covering, he moves to the second one that's to be made of curtains of goat hair. You say, wow, that's weird. Goat hair, of all the things God could use? Well, there's a practical side to this. Uh, to have a goat hair covering would provide uh, needed insulation to hold in temperatures and, and to, to moderate uh, the temperatures in, inside. So it had uh, a, a physical blessing that was a, a part of it, but it also represented something spiritual related to Jesus. Remember, uh, well, I can't tell you to remember, we haven't gotten there yet, but some of you might remember in Leviticus chapter 16, there is the single great highest and holy day in the Jewish religious calendar. And it's called the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. 
And what they would do, the high priest would do on the Day of Atonement after he had offered sin, sacrifices for his own sins, is he would take two goats without spot, without blemish, bring the two goats before the children of, of Israel, and they would cast lots related to the two goats. And uh, one of the goats would, would have uh, the lot cast toward it, and it would be the scapegoat. And, and so they would take that scapegoat, and they would move that goat o- o- over here to the side. And they'd take one of the two goats over here, and they would sacrifice it for the sins uh, of the people. It would be sacrificed. And, and the reason that God used two goats in this whole uh, kind of a ritual, holy ritual, on on the Day of Atonement was, and not just one goat sacrificed, we could look at that and say, beautiful picture of Jesus sacrificed for our sins and all, but that's not enough to represent fully what Jesus did for us on the cross. So they would take and sacrifice the one goat, and then they would take the other goat, a high priest would go over, lay his hands on the head of that goat, he would confess all of the sins of the nation of Israel over that goat, and then someone would take, who had this responsibility, would take the goat and lead it out into the wilderness to where it could never find its way back into the camp. And it represented the two great things that Jesus has done for us. He died upon the cross for our sins. But he also has taken and separated our sin as far from us as the east is from the west, the Bible says. And it's beautiful to think about that. It doesn't say that, that he separated, our, our sin has been separated from us as far as the north is from the south. Because if you go north and south, you can only go so far before you're going. You can only go north before you're going south after a little while. East from the west, you can go east as long as you want and you'll never uh, hit the west. You can go west as long as you want and you'll never hit the east. In other words, it's infinitely separated away from us because of what Jesus has done for us as, as our sacrifice. Isn't that wonderful to think about tonight? You have, don't shout out. You have anything in your past you're ashamed of? Just think, oh man, man. You will never come into contact with that sin in eternity. Jesus bore the price for that on the cross at Calvary. Won't come to our remembrance in the life to come. We won't think about it, life to come. Won't trouble us or haunt us in the life to come. That's our Savior. That's what He's done for us. That, that's how wonderful and full the work is. Now, one of the interesting that things that happened, the Jews did after a little while, and it indicates they had some problem with uh, goats who didn't understand typology. Because they, after a while, they would take the goat out of the camp and they'd run it off a cliff so it would die. Apparently they had a goat or two wander back into the camp, which really killed uh, the imagery. Uh, none of us wants to think about that wandering back into our life in eternity. And uh, so they, they kind of took things into their own hands and handled that way. Beautiful imagery concerning Jesus. I think, what a Savior we have. What a Savior we have. What a sacrifice he's made uh, for us. Beautiful. The curtains of goat hair. And to be a tent over the tabernacle. And of these you shall make eleven curtains. And the length of each curtain shall be thirty cubits. That is forty-five feet. And the width of each curtain four cubits, six feet wide. And the eleven curtains shall all have the same measurements. And you shall couple five curtains by themselves, six curtains by themselves. You shall double over the sixth curtain at the forefront of the tent. You shall make fifty loops on the edge of the curtain that, it's outer, that is outermost in one set. Fifty loops on the edge of the curtain of the second set, and you shall make fifty bronze clasps now to unite these two, because it's talking about sin. Bronze is a sign of, of judgment in the Bible. So these, these, these uh, sections are to be united by bronze class, put the class into the loops and couple the tent together that it may be one, again making it portable. And the remnant that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains shall hang over uh, the back of the tabernacle. Now the int- this is kind of interesting. How do we uh, describe it? Here's, see, you've got a table at home, dining room table. 
And let's say you buy a tablecloth that's way too big <laughs> for it. So you buy it, and uh, what happens is this linen curtain would go all the way over the frame. It would come down the sides all the way around, and it stopped 18 inches short of coming to the ground. wouldn't go to the ground. This particular covering covered it all the way, the linen covering, and it went to the ground. It covered that final 18 inches. And, and the interesting thing uh, uh, about uh, all of this is that uh, having, it, it, it would, as it would cover all the way down, it would, there was no way to see that linen curtain from the outside. He had to go inside to see that, that linen curtain. And, and a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side of what remains of the length of the curtains of the tent shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and on that side to cover it. And so here you have the curtain of, of the lambskins, again representing Jesus as the one who makes atonement for us, has allowed us to become at one mint. Uh, with God. Then the third covering is you shall make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent. Third covering was ram skins. So you look at that, ram skins dyed red. So you got a double picture of, of blood. And, and again, a picture of Jesus, who not only died himself, but he died for all of us. A, 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 a great death that occurred there. And so the, the ram skins were placed uh, over then the uh, goat's, uh, goat hair uh, curtain. Interesting thing about the ram skins, picture uh, of Jesus, a picture of his sacrifice upon the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. You notice in verse 14, kind of a short verse, Moses took a lot of time to um, describe the earlier curtains. And here it's like he's run out of ink or something and he's got to get, you know, knock these last two things of badger skin and the ram skins out in one verse. That's not what happens. There's a reason behind all of it. There are no measurements given for the covering of ram skins dyed red because there is no limit to the forgiveness that's found in Jesus' blood and his sacrifice for mankind. You can be saved tonight. I don't care what you've done in life. I don't care who won't talk to you anymore. I don't care how you are branded or thought of by other people, rightfully so even. God will forgive you. There's no limit to the forgiveness that's found in him. There's no sin or sins or all of the sins in human history all put together greater than his sacrifice for us. You know what that means? That means there's hope for you. And there is no hope for a sinner anywhere else in this world but in Him. But He's the sinner's hope. He gives us hope in this room, not only that He would forgive us, but that He would make us into something brand new and give us a fresh start. And He does that. And He won't even break a sweat doing that in your life. And He'll love to do that. And He's done it in most of our lives in this room. And then the fourth covering... It was a covering of badger skins above that. Now, the badger skins was the final outside uh, covering uh, of, of the four coverings, and it was waterproof. So it would protect all of the other coverings. It would protect anyone inside from inclement weather, from storms. It, would, it, was, it was a part of providing a refuge for the priests and God's people in their service to the Lord. In the same way that Jesus provides us with a refuge from the storms uh, of life. He's a place to run to in the moral stor storms, the dark sin storms, the craziness of, of the earth. He's a place to run into and be protected uh, through all of it. And the interesting thing about that uh, badger skin as it would cover badger skin. They don't really know whether it's badger skin. They have trouble identifying whether it's what kind of a skin. It was some kind of a waterproof skin. But you'd walk up from the tabernacle from the outside and you'd just look and say, you know, who built the creepy tent? I mean, it just looked like nothing from the outside. It just looked like this kind of uh, gray, brown, matted thing, you know, and all. It didn't look like anything from the outside. The, the only way you could discover the beauty of the tabernacle 
the full beauty of the tabernacle was to go inside, to go inside. And then, then you see the beauty. No one will ever see the full and true beauty of Jesus until we are in Christ Jesus, saved. And then we come into the fullness of what He is about. We see Him fully for who and what He is. Then we see the beauty. It was interesting that in Jesus' public ministry, how the religious leaders, they rejected Him, and, and they rejected Him on one main point. And, and the, big, the big stumbling block to them was His claim to deity. They believed the Messiah would be a great man. They did not believe that he would be divine, that he would be God in human flesh. Despite all of the Old Testament passages that prophesied that Messiah uh, would be. And so they struggled with that. You know, for what reason are you going to stone me? For what sin? Not for any sin or wrongdoing, but because you make yourself, you call yourself the Son of God and you make yourself equal with God. And they could never look beyond his humanity and, and see his deity. They could never ever see the, the beauty inside, always stumbled by the outside. And, 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 but when a person comes to know him, sometimes people say, well, I believe that Jesus is a great man, a great teacher. That was all he is. You know nothing of Christ. You know nothing of Christ. But you won't know what he's truly and fully like until you come to know him. You can know enough to know you should make him your Savior and your Lord. But you know, the, the beauty or the fullness of who and what he is, it unfolds to the person that's willing to become a follower of his. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Sometimes people look at that. I mean, here you are on, the, on a um, Sunday night. You're going to church. And your family and your friends know you're already here this morning. What are you, a religious nut? You crazy fanatic going to church two times on one day and everything like that when there's uh, all kinds of things to do out in the world and, and all of this and they look at what you know, you're doing and involved in, all they can see are, are the badger skins. They can't see what you see. And then one day what happens? They come in, the light goes on, and they go, Brother, I get it. <laughs> the beauty of Christ. Beautiful Savior. And, and so this is, uh, this is what that uh, represented. And then in uh, verse 15, he gets into kind of the framing of the whole thing. So you can't put all of these coverings on something unless you've got some kind of a frame or a structure for it. And so he begins to speak of that. And for the tabernacle, you shall make the boards of acacia wood standing upright. Again, when you, when you would go inside, it, it wasn't a flush kind of wall like this. And all you're seeing is, is wood because, number one, that wouldn't make a satisfactory frame. It wouldn't make a strong frame. And then number two, it would block the beauty of, of, of the tapestry and all that was there. And, and so, make boards of acacia wood standing upright. Ten cubits, fifteen feet, uh, shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the width of a board, uh, twenty-seven inches uh, wide. Two tenons shall be on each board for binding one another uh, at the end. Thus you shall make for all of the boards of the tabernacle. So they were to have a, like a little notch and a little tab at the end of it in order to interlock the pieces. And, and a whole system for uh, tying it together, interlocking it together. So again, it has to be portable. They can't nail the whole thing together. So I'm saying, who, who's the new Levite? They nailed the tabernacle together. You, uh, you, you had to be able to take it apart again for transport. And, uh, and so uh, beautiful uh, picture is, is all of this is... Uh, 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 could come together like that. The Bible talks about us in Christ being fitly joined together in the book of Ephesians. And so thus you shall make for all the boards of the tabernacle, and you shall make the boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards for the south side. You shall make 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets uh, under each of the boards for its two tenons. So here you've got these boards. You say, great, some of you are in construction. You say you've got these, these boards, you know, and uh, they're very, very tall, very, very uh, hefty kind of boards. But what's going to tie them together at, at the bottom? What's going to be the foundation? 
that keeps all of it stable. And, and he declares here that there were to be these um, Mm, the sockets of silver that would constitute the foundation. So these boards that have the kind of the, uh, a little tab at the end and they fit down into these, these sockets. So the whole foundation of the tabernacle was silver. And where'd the silver come from? It was, it was redemption money. Every child of Israel, every Jew had to pay a half shekel annually in order to, uh, as, as, as redemption money. And, and so that's what they would give. And it was just worth about 35 cents uh, each. But when you got millions of people doing it, you end up with tons of silver. And that's what they ended up with. So the foundation of the whole tabernacle is redemption. It's redemption. And, and so a picture of, of how everything, all of the riches that are in our life, the foundation of our life is, is the redemption that's been provided for us in Jesus. It, because he has provided it for us free. It's a stable uh, foundation. And for the second side of the tabernacle, the north side, there shall be 20 boards and there, and there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. From, for the far side of the tabernacle westward, you shall make six boards and you shall also make two boards for the two back corners of the tabernacle. They shall be coupled together at the bottom and they shall be coupled together at the top by one ring and thus it shall be for both of them. They shall be for the two corners. And so there shall be eight boards with their sockets of silver, 16 sockets, two sockets under each of the boards. And you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the tabernacle, five bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle for the far west side, uh, far side westward. And the middle bar shall pass through the midst of the boards from end to end. There will be no test on this at the end of the study. Basically, he's talking about a whole means of tying it all together. You have that much wood and, and everything, and you've got, to bring, you've got to bring some cross bracing in and that kind of stuff in order. But again, it has to be portable in order to stabilize uh, the walls. And so that's what he's talking about. And you shall overlay the boards with gold. So here you've got this 15 foot long uh, board, 27 inches wide. I don't know how thick you'd have to make it. Now you overlay it with gold. Now gold weighs quite a bit. And, and now you've you got to carry this. No wonder God set an entire tribe, the tribe of Levi, aside in order to handle the transportation uh, of the tabernacle and, and taking care of the things so that the priests could go on about the sacrifices and not be carrying this, putting this up, taking this down, and, and all. There was a lot involved with it. Make their rings of gold as holders for the bars and overlay the bars with gold. And you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain. Do it. Just do it. I'm just looking for faithfulness. I'm just looking for someone to do. And this counts for all ministry. Just looking for someone to do the simple thing that I'm calling you to do. Otherwise, we're going to mess up what he's, uh, he's, he's wanting to do with all of this. So the reminder. Then, then in verse 31, he moves on to a curtain or a veil that was put up between the Holy of Holies and the holy place. Remember the uh, tabernacle uh, in, in its size. One third of the, of the tabernacle, 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet, a cube, was the holy of holies. Uh, the other two thirds of the tabernacle was the holy place. The priest could go in to the... It was probably Moses. Uh, just did I, If I made a mistake, uh, tell him I'm in the middle of a Bible study. And uh, we'll talk about it later. So, but you get two thirds of it was the holy place. So the priests, regular priests, could go in there and serve with these other furnishings. Only the high priest could go into the holy of holies one day a year, on on the day of, of atonement. So between these two very holy places, now is is this uh, veil. And you shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen, 
and it shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. So you'd walk into the Holy of Holies, and again, you'd have the linen curtain on the inside. You would see all of these angels. It's going to be incredible to see the angelic activity up uh, up in heaven around the throne of God. And now all of that's being woven into the curtain. So you would go inside if you were the high priest and the curtain was closed. I mean, you're just surrounded by incredible supernatural activity. The beautiful thing is, again, as all of this uh, speaks of of Christ, the blue thread, the linen, of course, it speaks of uh, his perfect righteousness. It speaks of his sinless life. The blue thread, it speaks of, blue is the color of heaven, so it speaks of his heavenly origin, the fact that he is divine. The purple thread, it's a royalty, a color of royalty, speaks of the fact that he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. And then the scarlet thread, of course, scarlet, the color of blood, it speaks of his suffering and death for our sins uh, upon the cross. And so all of it continue to speak of him, beautiful, beautiful you know, kind of foretaste of heaven that they would have there in the tabernacle. And you shall hang it, uh, this uh, veil, really this very large, heavy curtain. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver. You shall hang the veil from the clasp, and then you shall bring the Ark of the Testimony. Uh, and it was called, it's the Ark of the Covenant, but it's called the Ark of the Testimony because of God's law being inside of it, which is the testimony of God. So you have to take the ark of the testimony in there, into the Holy of Holies, behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy place. And, and, uh, and so it was to be a, uh, a curtain of separation, speaking about how holy God is. I don't think we have an appreciation for the holiness of God sometimes. Certainly not in the world, do we? You know, what was it? So, what if God was one of us, you know, kind of a thing? So we kind of lower God to a pretty low standard, don't we, on things? But God was so holy, is so holy, that no one but the high priest and that only on one day out of the year and that only offering a sacrifice to cover his sin for the time that he was in the Holy of Holies could enter into the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, even with a mercy seat over the law of Moses. And the curtain was a a curtain of of, a, 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 a separation and, and the Bible tells us it represented Jesus' sinless humanity that provided unrestricted access to God uh, uh, for us. Access to God. Therefore, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Remember when Jesus died upon the cross, it is finished. As the priests are working in the temple, sacrifices, all these things going on, the, this veil that was now in the temple, the, the tabernacle is long gone by the wayside, but the veil veil is still a part of the structure. It's there. Josephus tells us that the veil uh, by that time was now 18 inches thick. And when Jesus died, that veil was torn from top to bottom all the way down, torn, in order to give, because of Jesus' death upon the cross, to give us access to God. It is really, I mean, a pinch yourself humbling that we can pray to God and talk to Him, that we can enter into His presence boldly at any time. I don't say that to make us feel like, oh no, I'm not good enough to do that, isn't that terrible? That No. But to just, as, as we go in and we go out all through the day to our Heavenly Father, praying, meeting with Him, communing with Him and all, and to, re, and to realize this was an, an access to God that God's people in the Old Testament couldn't even dream of. And it's ours every single day because of of Jesus and his body being torn in order to tear that veil and to gain us uh, that access. And 
He said, as he gives them kind of some instructions about how to move things around and place things there in the furnishings, in the tabernacle, he said, you shall put the mercy seat uh, upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy, and you shall set the table acro- outside the veil and the lampstand across from the table on the, south, on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, and you shall put the table on the north side. So God not only wanted these furnishings made, but he wanted them in a particular place within the tabernacle. Very quickly, uh, verse 36. And you shall make a screen, now talking about a curtain between uh, the uh, holy place and then the outside of the tabernacle. So uh, that, that particular screen, you shall make a door for the tabernacle woven of blue and purple scarlet thread fine woven linen made by a weaver. Again, all of the, the um, uh, things uh, uh, speaking of Jesus and you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood overlay them with gold their hooks shall be gold and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them there was only one way to enter into the holy, uh, holy place and that was through that door we're going to see that there's only one way to even in, enter the courtyard surrounding the tabernacle through one opening that God had provided. And the interesting thing that God does with all of these colors, now you remember you're looking at the outside of this tabernacle and you're just seeing badger skin, and then you see this unbelievably beautiful door screen that's right there in all of these colors. In other words, you couldn't miss it. And, and God made it just stand out from everything else. And it was the one way by which to approach God and to come into his presence. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And then what did God do? God, in sending his son Jesus' life, was so extraordinary as the way, as a curtain so different from everything else in the world that there was no missing him, his beauty and how a differentiation of, of his life. And, and he is, the picture, him as one way to God. Now, people have, people have a beef with that. I think they're just used to voting and stuff. Get a little proud and haughty on things. So you say, you know, I don't like this whole Christianity thing. It's just like one way. And, you know, I, I, you can call me whatever you want to call me. But I, I always think the same thing. Be thankful there's a way. You don't deserve a way, Buckarood. What, what are you talking about? You want three doors or something like that? You don't deserve one. Be thankful there's one. I'm so thankful there's a door. I'm so thankful there's a door. I'm so thankful there's a way, and I'm so thankful that the way is such a beautiful one that has gained the access to God. And then he tells us there in chapter 27, let's see what we got, yeah, okay. And he said, you shall make an altar of acacia wood, uh, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar shall be square, and its height shall be three cubits. And uh, so uh, here we, we've got about seven and a half uh, feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and uh, about four and a half uh, feet its, its height. And, and this is going to be a, a bronze altar that they're going to offer the sacrifices on. You shall make its horns on its four corners. It was to have a horn on each of the corners. It's, it's a square. And its horns shall be one piece with it, no screwing it on or anything like that. And uh, no weld wood or anything. It's to all be uh, fashioned together. And you shall overlay it with bronze. And bronze is, again, a, a metal that speaks of judgment. In the scriptures, and you shall also make its pans to remove to receive its ashes and its shovels and its basins and its forks and its fire pans. You shall make all the utensils that are associated with the bronze altar also of bronze, and you shall make a grate for it, a network of bronze, and on the network you shall make four bronze rings at its four corners. So you just got this gigantic. And it's, I don't mean to be flippant, but uh, if you ever you have like a Weber barbecue or something like that you're going to put the turkey on there whatever you're going to put on there the salmon and you've got that metal grate that's sitting there in order for you to put the the sacrifice on there it doesn't fall in 
uh, into the charcoal. So that's what you, you've got here. The sacrifices need to be laid on something uh, in order for them to burn. So there was this uh, grate put in place. And uh, you shall put under the rim of the altar, uh, you shall put it under the rim of the altar beneath and the network, uh, that the network may be midway up the altar. And you shall make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and overlay them with bronze. The poles shall be put in the rings, and the poles shall be on the two sides of the altar to bear it. Again, constructed for transportation. You shall make it hollow with boards as it was shown you on the mountain, so shall they make it. And so this uh, bronze altar uh, was, was to be made. I think that they would kind of bring it in. We don't know for sure, but somehow they would bring it into a place, set it down, probably build up earth on the inside of it so it could withstand the kind of heat that was going to come uh, up against it and, and hollow for that purpose, hollow for the, the, the sake of, of uh, transporting it. Beautiful symbol. The first thing is you would come into the courtyard where the tabernacle was located. The first thing that you would see in the courtyard uh, before you could proceed on to the tabernacle itself, which represented the presence of God, is this bronze altar. It was where burnt offerings uh, were offered, grain offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings, trespass offerings. All of these offerings, Leviticus uh, chapters 1 through 7, were offered there. And so what it did is it reminded everyone as they even came into the courtyard wanting to approach God, that God can only be approached by sinful man on the basis of a sacrifice for sin. God, man's sin cannot be ignored by a holy God. There must be a price paid in order to provide the forgiveness uh, of, of sin. And so man so often wants to approach God by ignoring his past, ignoring his sin. God cannot ignore our sin. He would be unrighteous if he did. Sin must be confronted. It must be dealt with. I must receive forgiveness of it in the way that God has chosen. And, and uh, Jesus is the way in which uh, the, our, our sin is, is to be forgiven. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. And according to the law, almost all things are purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Nobody can come to God without their sin being dealt with. And, and, and sometimes people think that well, I'll, I'll, I can come to God any time I want without believing in Jesus or God's way to come to him. I can pray to him. Those prayers go nowhere. I cannot approach him apart from my sin being addressed and forgiven and be given a new righteousness in which to come into the presence of God. It's an affront to God to completely ignore my sin and just think I can bust the door out and come in on my own terms. I can't do that. It doesn't work that way. The Bible says that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That means when we are at our best, we're, we're far from uh, uh, proper and, and ready uh, for, for heaven. And, and so you couldn't get into the Holy of Holies without a sacrifice for your sins at the model of heaven. How much more concerning heaven itself. Now, Jesus is the one that provides that kind of access. And so the bronze altar, symbol of the cross of Jesus, where his sacrifice his propitiation, full and satisfying payment for our sins has provided us with access to intimacy with God, to approach God, come even into his, his very uh, presence. And uh, so, beautiful picture of him. And you shall, let me just see what I'm going to Okay. And you shall make the court of the tabernacle for the south side. There shall be a hanging for the court made of fine linen, 100 cubits long. So he starts to talk about the courtyard around 
around uh, the tabernacle, and there's, it's kind of a fence, a cloth fence that's going to be around it. On the north and the uh, south uh, side, it's going to be 100 cubits long. That is 150 uh, feet long. On the east and west side, it's going to be 75 uh, feet long, uh, seven and a half feet high, uh, so that people couldn't just look over it and see what was going on. And it gave the priests privacy as they would do the work of the Lord there uh, in uh, surrounding the tabernacle and the sacrifices and all. And it's a picture of us being in the world. The curtain was a separation, being in the world, but not of the world as, as priests. And so it had 20 pillars, and their 20 sockets shall be bronze. And the hooks of the pillars and their bands shall be silver. Likewise, along the length of the north side, there shall be hangings 100 cubits long with its 20 pillars and their 20 sockets of bronze and the hooks of the pillars and their bands of silver. And along the width of the court of the west side shall be hangings of 50 cubits with their 10 pillars and their 10 sockets. The width of the court on the east side shall be 50 cubits, again, to accommodate uh, uh, a curtain. Uh, of entrance. The hangings on one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. And on the other side shall be hangings of 15 cubits with their three pillars and their three sockets. For the gate of the court there shall be a screen 20 cubits long. So on the east side there would be an opening now for another curtain even to come into the courtyard. That curtain would be woven of blue purple, scarlet thread, and a fine woven linen. So we see the same beautiful things. You've got this whole uh, fence all the way around, so to speak, of this white linen. And then you've got this one area that just stands out with all of the colors. Again, only one way for access to God, but God has made that one way absolutely clear uh, to mankind. Just because, no, I don't want to get into the whole one-way thing again. On, on, on the, just because it's a narrow way that God has provided uh, to get into heaven, it doesn't mean that it excludes anyone. Anyone can get in that wants to. Nobody's, nobody's excluded from salvation. But this doorway would really stand out. People would know that's the entrance, and uh, Jesus is the entrance uh, in, into heaven. All the pillars. Uh, around the court shall have bands of silver their hooks shall be of silver and their sockets of bronze the length of the court shall be 100 cubits the width 50 throughout and the height 5 cubits made of fine woven linen and its sockets of bronze all the utensils of the tabernacle for all its service all its pegs and all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze because of the sacrifices that are being offered there uh, in, in, to deal with our judgment for sin. Then he moves on to oil for the lamp. He's give, spoken to us of the menorah, but now the oil, the olive oil that's going to be provided for the lamp, he's particular about that. You shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. So the, la- the uh, menorah that was in the holy place, it burned all the time. They never were to let that uh, go out. Again, oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, it, it, in the illumination, the supernatural evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life is never to go out. There's no need to go out uh, for it to go out in our lives. Why? We can always ask to be refilled. Always be asked to be refilled on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, and God will do it. And and so that's what this pictures. Now, because it's the physical thing, it needed to be supplied with oil uh, by the priest. Verse 21, in the tabernacle of meeting outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening until morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. And so they would tend to the oil, make sure there was an oil supply every single day in order that it would never go out. And uh, typifying, here's the picture of the fact that, that there needed to be a daily refilling for that light to continue. We need to be continuing 
continually be being filled with the Holy Spirit for the supernatural of our life to be seen. Beautiful pictures uh, of Jesus. He has supplied through his sacrifice. He has supplied us with uh, the, you know, the helper, the Holy Spirit uh, coming into our lives. And so all of these things, they're all types. They're beautiful shadows and types of, of Jesus. But as Christians, we enjoy the, the real thing. The very substance of Jesus in our lives. He's the mercy seat. He's our mercy seat. There's mercy between us and the law. He's our table of showbread. Not only do we have so great a high priest, but we get to break bread with him. We can fellowship with him at any time in our service to him. He's our lampstand. He gives us light and revelation. Keeps us safe in a dark and dangerous world. You don't trip uh, with the light that he gives. Like the four coverings of the tabernacle. Linen. He is a... Uh, Our foretaste of heaven, the goat hair, he's made atonement for us. He has uh, separated our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. The ram skin speaks of the fact that he's our savior. The badger skin, he's our protection in the storms of, of this life. The veil, he's our way to the holy of holies. He's provided access to heaven and the things of God. Praise the Lord for a way tonight uh, to know God and, and to have fellowship with him. The bronze altar, he's borne the judgment that our sin uh, deserved. The oil, he has given us of his Holy Spirit. And so all of we've studied the shadow. Now as we head into communion, let's read of their substance concerning Jesus himself. Luke chapter twenty two. 